Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today's video is going to be about sort of the linking between theme, structure and imagery as it sort of occurs in Gardens of the Moon, the first book of the Malazan Book of the Fallen by Stephen Erickson. And the reason I want to talk about this is when, when we talk about the Malazan Book of the Fallen, one of the things that keeps coming up is people go, oh, the theme is compassion as if this is the, the only thing. Or we say, oh, it's a postmodern text, as if this is the only thing. So what I wanted to discuss is how a bunch of different things in Gardens of the Moon actually tell us partly how Erickson wanted us to read it, what he was signaling, all of these sorts of things. So the first thing I want to talk about is Gardens of the Moon as a postmodern text. Now, if you want to break down of what postmodernism is and how it relates to the Malazan Book of the Fallen, please go and see and view uh, Andy Smith's absolutely fantastic video, Postmodernism and uh, the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I link to it in the description. Andy has an absolutely fantastic breakdown, so there is no need to recap or summarize any of the stuff that he does in that video. It's a brilliant video, go and watch it. But when we start reading Gardens of the Moon, how do we know that a lot of the elements are meant to be read as subversion of trope, that they are being deliberately put in there as that. So if you know it's, it's postmodern, if you knew that's what Erickson was doing, that gives you insight into it. But if you don't know that, if you'd never heard that, how do we know? So one of the, the big things about this is the first thing to remember, by the way, this is going to be spoilers for Gardens of the Moon, eh, off the bat. But one of the things that you note about Gardens of the Moon is it's not flowing in a simple chronological sequence and um, you know one event after another. The initial prologue there are time gaps and that happens sometimes in in traditional narratives and then we have the Siege of Peel where there is essentially a flashback now, I, I've argued before that one of the ways of viewing this is that the magical energies released are so great uh, that chaos itself actually invades the narrative and that disrupts the telling of the story because of this event. And certainly that's a, a diegetic reason why you can read it that way. The other way of reading it is, of course, a much more standard structural approach, which is quite often we see the aftermath of something which looks terrible, looks disastrous. And then we get the, the jump back in time to see how did this thing occur? And it's a standard technique that we see in lots of different things. But let's have a think about this idea of subversion of tropes and, and why I think it's signaled very early on and it's something we should, we should be paying attention to. So if we think of the prologue, in the prologue, you have the introduction of the, the young boy, Gano's parents, saying he wants to be a great warrior, he wants to be a soldier of the empire. And this could be read as the traditional fantasy hero. He's the young boy, he's going to grow up to be the central protagonist and go on this big quest. And what we see almost immediately is that the veteran warrior basically warns him off this. And we can tell from the dialogue and, and what is said that this soldier is saying you are young you are naive that is not how the world works don't do that and then we find out that they are actually watching a riot in progress that is being put down and the young boy smells a what he thinks of as a slaughterhouse being on fire because he can smell it the burning of the meat and of course the soldier doesn't tell him that no that's not a butcher shop that's not a slaughterhouse that's that he's smelling those are people so it's a very dark world and we see this from the very beginning one of the next sequences that we we come across as it jumps forward a little bit in time is that um the young fisher girl and the wax witch are talking the wax witch grabs her and a soldier riding past a soldier of the malazan army comes to the young fisher girl's defense and hits the old wax witch killing her and then rides on as if nothing has happened so what we have here is something that is clearly morally ambiguous 
a soldier coming to the defense of an innocent person by the side of the road where they're not involved, we would traditionally read that as a very good action. But then there's such casual violence um, that is not remarked upon, which you know signals that this is a very violent world. It's a very dark world. It's a very morally gray and ambiguous world. And the wax witch dies, is killed, is murdered through the self-defense or the, the defense of another. And that suddenly places the Malazan army again in this very morally ambiguous. Are they good? Are they evil? It's not clear cut. This grayness, this ambiguity, this moral complexity is being played out again. So the sequence with the young Gano's Paran putting the, um, the insurrection and the riots down, that was all very morally complicated and the using magic against your own citizens, morally complicated. And we have exactly the same thing being reflected here, where the soldier in defending someone else, an innocent young girl, yay, soldier, paragon of virtue, kills the, the little old lady. Not, not exactly as, as good now, is it? Then we have these deity figures basically appearing, interfering in everything that's going on, and slaughtering all of the um, the soldiers, sending the hounds off to kill them. And you go, so who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? All of this is constantly bringing to the fore that there isn't a simplistic or there isn't a um, very straightforward moral alignment in this world. Things are complicated and things are nuanced. And we see this from the very beginning. And then when we get to Peel, again, because the perspective, the narrative perspective is with the Malazans, we're following with the Malazans. In traditional narratives, that means that these are going to be your protagonists. These are going to be the heroes. But what we see here is these are not heroes, even though we're on their side of the battle. And there is a narrative bias then toward their perspective and, and siding with them, we realize that in some respects, they are the aggressors. They are an imperial expansionist army and actually Peel are the defenders. And because in a lot of narratives, we root for the underdog, you would almost think that we should actually be on the side of the citizens of Peel. Then we see the Malazans engage in this magical uh, attack. Thousands of people die. It, it's absolutely terrible. It's this uh, awesome, brilliant, horrific, uh, scary battle sequence. And we see the ramifications, you know, what happens to Herlock. But in that sequence, once Moonspawn le uh, leaves, we're told that the Malazan allies, the Moranth, are going to exact an hour of blood in retribution for trade deals that Peel as a city beat them on. And they're going to go in and they're going to slaughter men, women, and children. So this is inherently evil. This isn't a war where you're defending yourself. This is a war of imperial aggression. And then you say to your allies, right, we've won the battle. You go in and slaughter a whole load of innocents. Again, this makes the Malazan side evil if we're going to use very simplistic definitions. But within that, we've seen that uh, Tattersail is actually someone we quite like. Her point of view is interesting. We, we'd already been introduced to Gano's Paran. We know that there's a complexity here, that there's something interesting going on. These, these are people we want to identify with, we want to root for, but they seem to be on the side of evil. And yet we still feel that loss when we hear about all of the bridge burners who died in the tunnels, this horrific death. And then we see Herlock, who's splattered in half, and Quick Ben and Kalam and Whiskey Jack come forward. And there's that whole thing. Everything up to this point, and remember, this is still only the start of the novel. We have seen perspective after perspective showing that these events, even though the narrative is from a certain point of view that has a certain bias, the narrative is showing us 
that things are complicated and are perspective dependent. And this ambiguity in narrative, this fluidity of perspective and how meaning can shift over time, destabilizes the narrative. This is not a narrative that is being told to you of this is exactly what happened and how you should think. And these are all signposts and signals of postmodern storytelling. So within the first two chapters, from the prologue, chapter one and chapter two, you should be very comfortable understanding that this is a narrative that is playing with narrative perspective, that is playing with positions of morality and is expecting you to extrapolate from the incomplete information. By showing you one side of something, the narrative is asking you to consider it from the other side, from the other perspective, without having to spell all of that out for you. So this is tying into very much the, the show don't tell aspect of Ericsson's style. So that's, that's one aspect here and you go, oh, so this has all been set up. And then if we think structurally, after we follow this sort of setup, this uh, establishment of who the Malazans are, what the Malazans are doing, we then move to Darugistan and the Daru. And in Darugistan, we find out that they are going to be the next element to be conquered, the next free city that is going to be conquered by the Malazans. That's where the Malazans are going next. So where the perspective about Peel was being implied, now Ericsson has actually moved to give us that perspective, which again destabilizes our perspective and our perception of the Malazans, because now we're seeing them as the invaders, we're seeing them as the enemy because we're seeing it from their next target's perspective. And of course, that contrasts with what we have sort of built up and what we're establishing in terms of our points of connection with the characters and the narrative perspective. So now that we're in Darugistan, we're seeing that this is an extension then of what could have happened at Peel, that idea of what's on the other side. And we have in mirror to the Whiskey Jack squad and these little char and these characters that we have on the Malazan side, we see the Phoenix Inn crew, um, Crocus and Marilio and Krupp um, and Call. that they are a mirror of the bridge burner crew that obviously they're going to follow and we're going to see the, the two of them as dark mirrors of each other a group on both sides so that we get both sides of this perspective. The military officers on the Malazan side trying to follow their orders and then the Darugistani crew and what they are doing. So it's built up into these um, large scale, grand scale, the Malazans versus the free cities, um, the Malazan army versus Darugistan. We see that nice conflict and then we see it on a micro scale between the bridge burner crew, the bridge burner squad, and the Phoenix Inn crew. So again, we have these two sides, but within that we see a breakdown within the Malazan side of there's Tashrin and there's Lorn and there's Tattersail and there's Dujek, that the Malazans are not a monolithic entity. They're there's a lot of internal politics. There's a lot of politicking and maneuvering going on within them. And that doesn't necessarily agree with what the bridge burners are doing. Then when we see Whiskey Jack Squad, we again see that it is not a monolithic entity. It is not a single entity, the squad. It's actually made up of personalities that have their own perspective, opinion, and desires about what they're going to do. So there is a fracturing of these groupings. Um, both on the micro scale within the squad, on the grander scale when you consider the command structure. And then we see that there's actually tensions between the idea of the Malazan Empire and the idea of the Malazan armies. So because we have that internal perspective, we can see that externally it might be, oh, the Malazans are coming, the Malazans are coming. But internally, it's a lot more complex. We then move back to the Darugistan, um, setting. And in there we see the conflicts and the different uh, individual desires of the Phoenix Inn crew, this Phoenix Inn gang. Krupp is doing one thing, Crocus is doing another thing, uh, Marilio is doing something else. That although they are a group and 
you know, I've just described them as the Phoenix in crew. Internally, when we have the internal perspective, we see that fracturing of a simplistic narrative about a group. And then we um, consider scaling that up because we see Baruch and what the cabal of sorcerers and mages within Darugistan are contemplating and their arrangements being made with Rake. But we see that that doesn't agree with what some of the councillors are doing, like Turban or. So again, from an internal perspective, we are seeing this fracturing of the narrative from that very simplistic, if you were standing on the Malazan point of view, looking at Darugistan and going, this is what Darugistan is doing, this is who Daru the Darugistani are, the Daru are, these are their plans. That's the external viewing the group. But as soon as we move into the group, we see again that shifting of perspectives, the individual desires of these characters. We see how they are willing to betray certain aspects of the society to either personally benefit them or to make deals to benefit the whole of the city. So from a sort of narrative perspective, when we think about stories being told, very, very often we get these very straightforward, this is what they think. But what Erickson is doing here is he is destabilizing this narrative. He is showing us the inherent complexity of human relationships and how he, in doing all of this, is actually illustrating a very prevalent um, thing that happens in our world, which is when we are external to a group and look at the group, we assume a uniformity, we assume a cohesiveness to that group because externally it's us and them and we class them as an almost monolithic entity. But if we are within a group, we don't see it as monolithic because we're more aware of the nuances and individual things that are going on. And so that fractures and we can see that um, from family units where someone looking at your family go, oh, it's the family of so-and-so, and they think of the family as a unit. But when you're in it, you're going, oh, my brothers and my sisters are different, and my parents want this thing, and I don't want that thing. That there are internal divisions, but externally, it's all one family. You move further out and you go, externally, it's all one community. Externally, it's all one city. Externally, it's all one nation. Externally, it's all one national alliance. Each time when you're outside of the grouping looking in, you can assume a cohesiveness. But when you're inside, when you have that additional information, it actually falls apart because everything fractures. Everything is made up of smaller parts. So the sec second sort of aspect of this that I wanted to talk about is that thematically, a lot of stuff is signaled very, very early on about the intervention of the divine because what we see in the, the narrative that is occurring, we see it as a conflict between the Malazans and the Daru in Darugistan. But we actually see that at the end, and some people think that this is a bit of a left turn in the narrative because suddenly there's a supernatural threat is, is uh, attacking Darugistan and things change because raced as a supernatural threat almost essentially unifies all of the different parties because raced as a supernatural threat is external to both the Malazans and the Daru. And what we then see is the Malazans, the Crimson Guard, the Daru, all battling different elements of the external supernatural threat because that is a threat to humanity. Um, and it doesn't matter about your national divisions when there's an existential threat to the entirety of the race. So again, we see this, that race looks at them as humans. So he is assuming um, that cohesive grouping. They, uh, instead of saying, I'm a Malazan and I'm a Daru, instead of seeing those divisions say, well, we're both human and that thing isn't. So we see that very neatly showing what I've just been talking about. But this supernatural element, when we consider a lot of these things were set in motion by Shadow Throne and Cotillion interfering in part of what was going on in the Malazan 
empire, slaughtering the soldiers, possessing Sorry. That is what happens at the beginning. And then we have Opon, the, uh, the god, the twin god of luck, interfering in what is going on in both uh, Peel and also in Darugistan. And then we have this interference is very much the gods manipulating mortals to uh, play their own game. And in contrast then, because we see this all the time with Ericsson's writing, that he shows us one thing and then will show us something that is apparently different, but actually structurally is very similar. We have Reik as a near supernatural godlike figure entering in to defend the mortals, the humans from these godlike interferences, as well as the Malazan Empire. But again, Reik is this super powerful entity entering into a mortal conflict. So we have a balancing then between Shadow Throne, Cotillion, Opon, and Rake, these supernatural entities coming in to either manipulate or defend. And of course, that's then reflected in what Rist symbolizes as this old supernatural force coming in to destroy. So again, all of these different things are showing this movement of supernatural events, deities, powerful magic, trying to influence the mortal world. These unseen figures playing games and attaching um, invisible strings to mortal characters to get them to dance to their whim. And of course, this is signaled at the very, very beginning in the prologue by that image of the weather vane on Mox Hold, because the weather vane is being pushed and manipulated by an invisible force, the wind, this natural force that is trying to push it in different ways that it is trying to resist. So we can look at that as symbolically representing this idea of this invisible force, these deities, these supernatural entities, interfering in the manipulation of national um, expansion in terms of the Malazan Empire, both for and against. So thematically, everything is actually signaled very early on and connects all the way through to the end. So we can look at this in terms of a postmodern deconstruction of how narrative should function. We can look at it in terms of this deconstruction of colonialism, post-colonialism, imperialism. We can look at it in terms of the deconstruction of what social grouping actually means and an understanding of that in terms of the individual versus the group and all of these things presented in a narrative manner that is not casting judgment for the most part on the actions themselves it's not making a moral judgment about which side is good and which side is bad it's inviting the reader to engage with it and assess it themselves. And again, that movement away from a story telling you something to a story asking you to engage with it is signaled very early on, and it is something that carries all, all the way through. So a lot of times when people talk about Gardens of the Moon and the Malazan Book of the Fallen, a lot of people find Gardens of the Moon to be complicated. And I obviously, don't. I, well, I, I find it to be intricate. I find all of these different points of connection. And this is what I think is one of the strengths of the book. And it's why this book, even though other people prefer the stories in, in the rest of the Malazan series, this book remains my favorite of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Because in this, I see all of these things that are setting the template for what is to come. So I hope uh, that's been interesting, entertaining. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.